So guys, we're going to come back, um, end those conversations, carry them on at the end of the service. It's always a great way of um, meeting new friends during the piece. Do continue those. Uh, we've got Janina here. She's going to do our reading for us today, which is Matthew 7, 7 to 8. Thank you. Morning. Um, the reading today is Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find... F- you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Thank you, you Nina. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Glenn. If we've not, not met before, I'm part of the clergy team here at Love Church. I'm normally hiding over at St. Clement's on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's good to be back here. Um, this morning we're going to continue our preaching series looking at praying like monks, ligaments like fools. Come on, I said it right. Um, so uh, yeah, we're going to continue our preaching series. Um, we're going to be looking this morning, this morning at ask, seek, knock. Uh, silence and persistence in prayer. So far within this preaching series, we've had Tim help us uh, by, looking at, by interviewing Sam Mutton, looking at Holy Ground. Then we had Hooch uh, talking to us about be still and know, uh, reminding us to uh, continue a prayer posture of keep it simple and keep it up. And uh, we also last week had the incredible privilege of having the powerful and profound testimony of Mike and Katie Apps as they discussed intercession, choosing to focus on life over death. They explained that they live in both well, we live in both a beautiful world, but a brutal world. And therefore, we are to pray for a miracle. We are to pray for the big miracles. But it's also important to pray for the strength to uh, get through each and every single day. And this morning, we're going to look at unanswered prayer and unwavering faith. We're going to break it into a few sections. First of all, the why, persistent prayer, hope, and finally, the practical application. The central phrase that I would like us to focus on was prayed by Jesus in Mark 14. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. And to begin, I'm going to briefly share a little of my experience on the topic of unanswered prayer. There have been many moments in my life in which I could share from but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be real. I'm going to go there. And what I'm going to do is share a situation in my life that's ongoing. Uh, an area of my life that seems at the moment unchanged and my prayers unanswered. Abs, my wife, um, who spoke here a couple of weeks ago during our pre- preach uh, mania, spoke of her struggles with chronic health conditions. And um, for the last five years, I've witnessed her suffer each and every day in excruciating pain, knowing and wrestling God. I've been praying every day for her to be healed, and yet those prayers right now remain unanswered. I have seen miracles take place, and I've prayed for people and witnessed God move powerfully in their lives, and yet with my wife, She continues to suffer. This has been a source of conflict for me with God. I find myself having to wrestle God, but also accept that we may not receive the answers to the prayers in the particular way that we're asking, this side of heaven anyway. We don't know if healing will take place physically, but we live in an eternal perspective knowing that one day we all receive healing. We all receive healing. And Tyler in his book explains how he knows the power of God and the silence of God and sometimes thinks it would be easier to handle the silence better if power wasn't on the table at all. This is something that I felt. If we didn't know God could heal with a single word, then we could handle the situations more easily. 
But he can. He can heal with a single word. Within this chapter, it says that life has a way of dealing us a card or two that we never saw coming. And I don't know how to make sense of. We are robbed of the life we thought was so securely ours. Sometimes we create a picture of our own, in our own mind of how we think life may p- play out. We make plans based on those ideals. But what happens when this is turned upside down, like it was for us five years ago? When the rug is pulled from under us? Moving to the why, sometimes it appears as though we may ask God for something trivial like a, like a parking space. I can't be the only one. I can't be the only one. And it appears that sometimes this is answered. Um, but, but, and, 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 and yet, we can go to God with our deepest desires and these remain unanswered. And I imagine I'm not alone in this. I think we could all ask that question one way or another or a question along these lines. Why does God heal some people but not others? Why do some people lose their lives early and others live to 116? The oldest person alive today is 116, 319 days. I mean, amazing. Why do do people have natural deaths and others die as the result of war? Why do some people lose their jobs and others don't? Why are some people living in poverty and others in extreme affluence? Why do some marriages last and some fail? If we look at Peter and James in Acts 12, we see that both were imprisoned. Both were being prayed for, interceded for by their faithful communities. And yet Peter was freed and James was killed. Both were interceded for. Yet God only saved one. Why? God's silence causes confusion. If we confidently say, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you, why does he seem silent in the midst of our pain and suffering? Why does he seem to be be absent when we need him most? Within Tyler's book, a quote says that perhaps a conclusion that some might come to is that either God is not powerful enough or God is not good enough. What happens when our asking doesn't result in answers despite our knocking? What happens when when those answers our seeking leaves us with more questions than answers and and despite our knocking, this door just isn't opening? It's just not opening. So what about when events lead us to prayer, but our prayer leaves us there alone in that same place? We know that God sees all things, and therefore, if God remains silent despite our desperate cries, is he willingly ignoring our distress? How do we reconcile this? How can we process the knowledge that God could possibly do this as our loving Father? Now, it could be said that the Bible is far more honest about unanswered prayer than the church. Right? With large sections of scripture focusing on lament and suffering, it's important that as a church that we go there. It's important that we discuss this vital topic to share in the questions and the wrestle and support each other. In seeing where God is working, and lift each other up. It's important to acknowledge that we are simply not alone. We could feel that wrestling in unanswered prayer means that we're lacking in faith. I've heard that before. But it is in fact an act of faith to have the depth of a relationship that draws you to a place of questioning. Unanswered prayer is neither a lack of faith nor a lack of God's ability but it is a lack of his not being his will. Parker Palmer says the following, our deeper faith, the more doubt we must endure. The deeper our hope, the more prone we are to despair. 
the deeper our love, the more pain its loss will bring. These are a few of the paradoxes we must hold as human beings. If we refuse to hold them in the hopes of living without doubt, despair and pain, we also find ourselves living without hope, faith and love. Even Jesus, when on the earth as fully God and fully human, experienced unanswered prayer. We see Jesus needing to pray for the blind man twice, asking God, take this cup of suffering from me in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see the the apparent silence of God when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The apparent silence of the cross of God in that moment echoes the depths of his sacrifice. Yet in that silence, in that silence, salvation's plan was unfolding. Paving the way for the resurrection that would conquer death. Finally, we read Jesus' prayer for the church to be one. And yet we know that there is still division amongst God's people. This is a prayer that, in my mind, and to the minds of lots of theologians, is yet to be unanswered. Yet to be answered. Throughout his ministry, Jesus faced challenges, rejection, and apparent limitations in his humanity. His prayers for the salvation of souls, healing, and reconciliation may not have been immediately evident, but the unseen work of God was at play. Preparing the grand culmination of all things. The cross hasn't been fully redeemed yet. When the time comes for that full and final redemption, Jesus could be asking, will I find men and women of faith? When I return, will I find men and women of faith? Will I find any who haven't lost heart along the way? who have trusted me and my promises enough to keep praying in the face of waiting and disappointment. Amidst the silence, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus too experienced the silence of the cross. Yet through his unwavering faith in in, in the Father, he emerged victorious. Let the life of Jesus inspire us to trust God even when we cannot trace his hand. There is in this world sometimes a question as to whether our suffering is based on punishment. Anyone else heard that? Perhaps a belief that we get what we deserve, that there is such a thing as karma. However, the book of Job speaks directly against this. And it shows us that God does not punish or reward based on our actions or our works. Unanswered prayer is not a result of our actions. There is also sometimes a belief that we are entitled to an easy life. That we're supposed to thrive at all times with only mountaintop experiences. However, this isn't biblical. We read of the disciples dying horrific deaths, horrible deaths, living through persecution. God does not owe us anything. God does not owe us anything. We are not entitled to healing in the now, and we are not entitled to an easy life. That's a bitter pill to swallow. It's a very bitter pill to swallow. But this is not to say that God doesn't want us to thrive. We all know that Jesus came to give us life and life to the full. And there will be indeed mountaintop experiences, but there are also valley moments. No matter how you explain life, you're always stuck trying to find a a solution to the square peg called justice fitting into the round hole called suffering. We are all called to trust the judgment of God. Sometimes God keeps us in that place of suffering uh, to use as a a place of witness. Abs remains unhealed at this moment in time, and as a result, she is far more equipped and far more able to speak to somebody suffering with chronic illness more than I am. 
I can't speak to God being good in that place. She can. And this is something that she's uniquely placed for. And it shows us that nothing we experience is wasted, even if we cannot understand the why. Now, when God answers prayer, he answers typically in three ways. I hope you know that. Um, but we're going we're gonna to go through that. Uh, he answers in three ways. Yes, not yet, I have something better in mind for you. It's easy to pray when the answer is yes. It's, it's less so when it's a no. Unanswered prayer may be the result of God's sovereign plan, aligning with his wisdom and his perfect timing. While we may not always understand, we need to trust that God works for the good of those who love him, Romans 8. Unanswered prayers can lead us to personal growth, increased reliance on God, and alignment with his greater purpose for our lives and for those around us. The difficulty is that if God responded with a straightforward no, while it'd be a bitter pill, at least we'd know that he'd hear us. That he's, in his infinite wisdom and eternal perspective, has responded in a negative way. No invites us into a further relationship. No is disillusioning, but it still leaves a foundation for communication. But silence, silence. Silence feels like apathy for the sufferer, like God is unmoved or uncaring about what is going on down here. Pain and suffering have the capacity to deepen you and transform you, but they also have the capacity to destroy you. How does the very pain that is eating us alive become an agent of deep transformation? We have to invite God, the very one who broke our trust, into the muck with us. When we are living with unanswered prayer, knowing God could change our situation with a single word, we can lose trust for him. I've told him a number of times, I'm starting to not trust you. We can lose trust for him. And yet, it's in this moment that we so desperately need him to meet us in that mess. We need Jesus to climb down into the pit with us. Jesus is the only one who can come down into our mess and show us the way out. Prayer is asking, looking from the vantage point of heaven and pointing God into the mess. But prayer is also weeping in the middle of a mess so thick that we cannot see up. We can only scream through tears, Lord, I can't bear it any longer. We are all going to face painful disorientation at some point. And the challenging invitation is to trust even in the darkness. Corey Ten Boom puts it this way. When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away your ticket and jump off. You sit still and you trust the driver. Now, Abs felt God saying to her very clearly at one point, if this is it, if this is how life is going to be for you, am I still enough? Am I still enough? Am I still good enough? And that's the big question, isn't it, for us all? If our prayers remain unanswered, do we still choose to follow him? Do we still trust him? Trusting God in times of perceived silence requires holding on to the assurance of his character, reminding ourselves of all the good that he's doing and has done. Understanding that his ways are beyond our comprehension. The Bible encourages believers to cast their anxieties on him, knowing that he cares. It's a journey of faith, seeking comfort in his promises and maintaining hope even when the answers seem elusive. To look at the persistent prayer, we need to remind ourselves that this world, in its current form, is passing away. But our prayers and our tears are eternal. We're instructed to pray without ceasing. As Hooch said, keep it simple and keep it up. 
There's no fancy words. Keep it simple, keep it up. Prayer then is our biggest and most powerful weapon. If we're invited to pray persistently and enter into an ever-increasing relationship that's intimate with God through prayer, as Tyler says, prayer is a journey that starts with need and ends in relationship. Prayer is a journey that starts in need and ends in relationship. Prayer is a primal language, instinctively emerging from us in the face of pain and suffering. We are designed to respond to prayer. It is instinctively our default setting. How many times do you hear people that don't have a faith crying out to God in a moment of absolute uncertainty? Prayer in any form, by anyone, is God's invitation to pull up a chair to the table and enjoy restful, intimate, unbroken conversation with the triune God. Or as Jesus succinctly said it, Knock and the door will be open to you. The infinite other, the alpha and the omega, the holy and infallible welcomes us to his table. He affirms our person, chooses our company and delights in our presence. Despite our questioning, God chooses relationship, intimacy with us and our company. Our questions do not daunt God They do not cause him to pull away from us. In fact, he draws closer. Our persistence in prayer comes from the promise that we don't pray to a reluctant, half-interested, can't-be-bothered judge, but to an unfathomably loving father who cares and collects our prayers like love letters and our tears like fine wine. What keeps us praying What keeps us praying? We must recover an understanding of the way that God is. And he's constantly at work. Not just in the final promise, but in all acts of the persistence along the way. Wrestling with God through persistent prayer is a confirmation of true belief, not distressing doubt. The wrestle equals faith. You take your pain, your wrestling to the Father. If my daughter's were distressed and they were experiencing pain and suffering I'd want them to bring that to me I wouldn't want them to try and hide it or make it lighter than it is I want them to be real and that's the same with God our heavenly father wants us to come to him with our pain he wants us to run to him with the suffering that we experience The Bible teaches us that God's ways are higher than our ways, Isaiah 55. His timing is perfect, Ecclesiastes 3.1. In times of silence, the Bible encourages us to remember that the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. That's Philippians 4. Trusting that God hears and answers according to his will. 1 John 5. This persistence deepens our faith and reliance on God's sovereignty. In Matthew 7, 7 to 8, Jesus encourages believers to ask, seek, knock. Not as a one-time request, but as a a continuous activity. Promising that we will receive, find, and have doors open to us. Unanswered prayers can be reconciled by understanding God's plans may differ from our immediate desires. And so we must trust that he works all things for good. What keeps us praying? It's knowing Abba Father. Everything for you. Abba Father, everything is possible for you so what about hope when looking at current suffering within the framework of now and not yet we see that while revelation 21 promises a future without pain sorrow tears we are still in the now where suffering exists 
Revelation encourages believers to find strength and hope in God's promises despite our present challenges, anticipating the fulfillment of Revelation 21 in the future. This perspective emphasizes the tension between the current struggles and the ultimate restoration in God's plans. When Jesus returns, the battle that was won on the cross will conclude. Thanks to our God who knows the overwhelming nature of suffering in a fallen world, who displayed healing power and chose personal suffering as a method, as a means for our ultimate healing. That's a miracle. It's the only miracle we need. Life is like, life here is kind of like the contents page of an everlasting book. Um, we live in an etern- if, if we live in an eternal perspective, although the suffering is immensely painful, we have eternity, a time that never ends. Without pain, without suffering, we'll live with questions in the now that don't have answers. But while we're here on earth, we pray persistently knowing that suffering will be concluded. God has the victory. He has the victory and our suffering world will end. God bends history so that the moments of our greatest pain become moments of our greatest redemption. Twisting the story to be sure that the pain that we feel releases the power of new life. And the tears that we cry become the foundation of a better world. We are promised that a day is coming when the Father himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. But until then, we have to live on in the in-between stage with the promise, I will not let a single one of your tears be wasted. So, how do we live this out practically? Keep on asking. It will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. That's the invitation Jesus offers us. And anyone who takes him up on it and prays in this way long enough will eventually find themselves on the doorstep of resilience. Say it like you mean it. Say it like you mean it. When you're praying to God, say it like you mean it. Name your pain and be real. He knows when you're not authentic. Tell God your disappointments in prayer and don't water it down. Maybe try forgetting your manners for a minute. Tell it like it is. But the big thing is listening for the question. Invite invite God to show you the question beneath your disappointment. What is the question beneath your disappointment? Beneath the circumstances left in the wake of your disappointment lives a question about the character of God. You might ask, is God really loving? Is God really listening? Does God really care about this part of my life? Is God really powerful? Can God even heal this? Is God leaning towards redemption? Listen until you find that question that you're looking for that is at the root of what you're feeling and ask God to meet you in that question. Whatever the question is that you identify underneath the disappointments, take that to God and allow him to meet you there. He will meet you there. So to finish, let us persist in prayer with unyielding faith, knowing that God hears our cries, trust in the one Abba Father with whom everything is possible. Keep your mind focused with an eternal spectre of Jesus' victory on the cross, knowing that there will be a day when suffering ends and all questions will be answered. Embrace the silence as a time of refining and preparation, confident that God is at work. May our hearts echo the words of Jesus in Gethsemane, not my will, Lord, but yours. What's God up to now? What's God up to? He's weaving history into a redemptive good future for his chosen ones. That's you, that's me, and that's everyone that calls Jesus Lord. God says, I hear you, and I will make all things right 
and all things new. And that creation, that new creation, is seeded by the prayers of God's people and watered by their tears. Both are key ingredients in the remaking of the world. So we're going to have a time of ministry. We're going to have a time of responding to God from, our, from however we're coming to him now. However we walk through the door, whatever lives we're living at home, he knows it all. And so I pray that you come to the Father. Come to the Father in your wrestling, in your place of pain, in your suffering, with all your questions. Just come and be real. Come and receive prayer in your place of waiting. We're here to pray for you this day and always. God is waiting and he's here for you at all times. So we pray, come Holy Spirit. Amen.